the title of my talk and uh, slash demo is big uh, geospatial data with open source tech so i'll be covering how to process vectors rasters uh, but with big data technologies if you're not familiar with that side so there are some geometricians in the in the house so i'm sure you're very familiar with the stack on you know single uh, machine uh, stack that that's very mature uh, the point here is to see how we can do it uh, on the big data side and big, big data technologies and uh, spark based in particular and map matching is to and i'll get to explain that uh, uh, a bit later so doing map matching but again with uh, on the big data side that is connecting spark with osrm engine and uh, uh, and do it on a large scale so i'll give a quick bio for the ones who don't know me uh, and then going to uh, give an introduction to Spark uh, again for the ones who are not familiar with that uh, technology, that cluster technology. A quick tour of uh, web UIs, web user interfaces. On the second part, uh, going to uh, concentrate on vectors and how to process vectors with Geomesa. Third section, going to uh, show you how to process rasters on uh, on um, on large scale with GeoPySpark, which is the Python interface to GeoTrellis. So both GeoMesa and GeoPySpark are um, uh, they, there's some overlap between the two. So GeoMesa we are using it mostly for vector processing, but it has some support for raster and the other way around for GeoTrellis. That is. It's a primarily raster-based engine, but it has some support for vector processing. So for us, it's better to, we have decided to basically support them both because it's just more efficient to do, you know, concentrating on the strength of each of these components. So GeoMesa we're using for vector, ra, ras, uh, vectors and GeoPySpark for, uh, for rasters. And at the end, I'll, I'll show you uh, how we have connected Spark with OSRM, which is basically the open source routing uh, routing machine to uh, be able to do um, basically map matching on a large scale. So I'll, I'll show you uh, the arch architecture. There are some code walkthroughs here and there are some demos that I'll actually execute as we go. So you'll you get a good idea regarding that. Quick, bu quick uh, bio here. So I've spent about uh, past several years on different companies and different data science projects. Uh, big data applications, distributed algorithm design, uh, high performance computing, uh, deep learning uh, product development in uh, different industries. Uh, so I've developed products, both deep learning, machine learning, and uh, uh, traditional machine learning libraries, that is, and, uh, and uh, distributed algorithm design. And that kind of uh, experience has been a uh, basically come together and we have, de we have uh, developed Unautocode, which is coming out of this experience that there were uh, we, I've, I tended to use you know, different platforms that they had uh, components missing or they didn't have native support for this and that including geospatial <clears throat> and this uh, uh, this platform basically uh, was our uh, came out of, out of an internal need for us to be able to support this this evening is about geospatial and actually that you know geospatial projects has come my, my way uh, frequently in the past several years and uh, there was no big data platform that basically had native support for that and uh, and so kind of when we were building Unautica this was on my really priority list to bring in the components that I needed to get things done on my side so this is and uh, we are basically uh, explaining how we have select we have we are tackling these three specific use cases This is a slide from our presentation of the of the platform. So this is the geospatial part, and I'm gonna explain the number one, three, and four here. Uh, you know the map matching part, uh, the vector processing and raster processing. So I'll I'll do a deep dive when I, when I get there, but probably the only point that I'm gonna highlight that the, the Spark cluster. This is our base. Uh, a base setup, which is a Unalka instance, we have four primary nodes. That is a base setup. And then uh, 
And these workers can be extended, basically, can be replicated, the stack can be replicated. And so this is use case dependent uh, and uh, data size dependent. So as if we need more data, we extend it. Here for this demo, we have the base setup, which is the master, uh, master one, master two, a GPU worker here and the CPU worker. Uh, Spark is CPU engine, uh, CPU uh, based engine. So we're not gonna use the GPU card uh, that is sitting here, but uh, there's a Spark worker executor here, and there's another one here running. So we have the master Spark master on master one, and uh, a worker slash executor on each of these two workers. So it's a Spark of basically Spark cluster of two two workers. Spark uh, for the ones who are not familiar with uh, what Spark does. Uh, here's a quick uh, graph from Databricks that shows basically what uh, you know the main uh, libraries that Spark uh, supports and it has integrated. So you could do with Spark uh, machine learning, graph analytics, uh, streaming applications, and uh, you can do SQL. And you can talk to Spark in several languages, and we are using uh, Python here. But you could, and Scala is the main language, the native language that Spark has been developed in, but it supports different languages. Zeppelin is a, for ones who are not familiar, again, uh, it's, think of it as equivalent to Jupyter Notebook, but it's more uh, usual to be used on the cluster side and the cluster technologies. So, uh, we, we say it's a Zeppelin note, which is equivalent to a Jupyter Notebook. And each of one of these is a paragraph. And each paragraph, we define what the interpreter is. So here we have a PySpark interpreter. So we are basically can execute the PySpark code here. Here's a markdown, which we are using as a uh, documentation. So each one of these is a paragraph. Again, we are using PySpark here, and here we are using Spark SQL interpreter. So the advantage of uh, Zeppelin is that you can switch basically language and the engine that is behind from one paragraph to the next, depending on what you're doing. So you can put everything together in a single, single Zeppelin node, which in contrast with Jupyter, in Jupyter you select the kernel and everything else has to be understood under that, but uh, Zeppelin lets you switch between the two, uh, between many interpreters uh, uh, that, that it can, it, it supports. It supports actually a couple of dozen, I think. There's a, it has nice integration with Git, actually. So each uh, paragraph is, is version controlled, so you can actually go back and forth. Uh, these are screenshots I have actually open, you know, in my browser, I have them open. So if you wish, I can, you know, during Q&A, I can like, jump in and show you uh, more deeply what it does, but this is just have the slide a bit more complete. This is the Spark Master, and these are the two workers. So this is the interface to actually check out what Spark Master does. So this is the two workers that I mentioned. We are giving six cores out of eight to, to each worker, and about half of the memory of machines. So each executor is using six cores, uh, 25 gig, and when, uh, when you're launching the Spark application through Zeppelin, it uh, launches a, a long-running Spark application, which is called Zeppelin here. And then every processing that we do becomes a job within that long-running application. And this is, for example, one, one of those jobs. And, and uh, this is a processing job that, uh, that you'll see at the end that I, we've done a performance test of map matching to see how fast we can go. And uh, over those uh, uh, 20,000 something trips that the, we did, uh, we processed it in, uh, in about 10 minutes. And uh, this is monitoring of a Spark application. You can dig in and you, you know, diagnose the performance issues and whatnot. So it's, it's happening through this interface, uh, interface of a monitoring of a Spark application. And when that uh, processing was done, that map matching uh, processing uh, performance test one what was done, uh, it's, it saved the results here on, the, on our HDFS, uh, Hadoop distributed file system. So we use Hue for 
basically uh, as a nicer web interface to interact with uh, HDFS. Uh, it gives a bit nicer, nicer interface to work with HDFS. So this is just a view of, of, of the file that was saved on HDFS after the processing was done. And uh, I'll mention this file towards the end as well. This is our Git server. Uh, this is running on master two, if you've noticed, on our default machines. So Zeppelin is basically connected to this Git server, and then we are monitoring basically uh, each Zeppelin node here. Uh, so each Zeppelin node is monitored, and then the and we have a tight integrate. We have a tight control over basically the uh, over the versions and changes that goes into each Zeppelin. Uh, Zeppelin note that we, uh, we use as a reference implementation. So section two, now going to Geomesa. Geomesa supports uh, many uh, data stores. So there are different types of uh, places that you can put your data in. Uh, here we are using file system data store, which is our HDFS. So basically, the data is going to be put on HDFS, and GMS is going to read from that. But GMS has support for many different types of, uh, basically, data storage technologies. So you can use that. Uh, you, you can choose some of those the other types of technologies if, for example, your data is already in some other kind of cluster. And if GMS can connect directly, then you can do that. But if not, then uh, you can always go to a file system data store. We are already, we were already running an HDFS uh, cluster, so it was natural for us to connect this. The data set as a demo that we are choosing is called GDELT. Um, it's a global database of events, language, and tell. So it's a data set that is a description on the left side, on the left top. So it's uh, basically events that are happening over the web everywhere, and there's just a GPS uh, point that is connected to this event. So it could be a newspaper article, or it could be anything, basically anywhere around the world. So they collect this, and they update this data set, and you're just uh, using this data set as a demo here. On the bottom left, this is how we are grabbing that data set, and we are putting it on our HDFS. So it's a Hadoop uh, distribute copy command that is bringing uh, data from that S3 bucket that contains the data set. So we are grabbing the first few days uh, in 2017, and we are putting it in that uh, uh, slash temp uh, uh, file path on our HDFS. So this is the first, let's say, download of the file from, from our internet, from an S3 bucket. And then this is a command, basically, to uh, ingest and partition that data. So the way this works is that uh, there's an ingestion command, and, and this is the command plus the output of that command. So here we are, ha we are basically saying this is just our source data. So this is where we basically saved it here uh, on the bottom left. So we are saying to this command, OK, pick up the data from here. Uh, and at the end, uh, when you're done with the ingestion and, uh, and partitioning, put the data uh, here. So that is going to be our, our destination. We are saying, uh, you know, use parquet format, and we are partitioning slash indexing the data on both uh, temporal and uh, spatial dimensions. So it's all, uh, so it's daily partitioning and also spatial uh, dim uh, spatial partitioning. So we are using Z order uh, or Morton order, which is basically combining uh, latitude and, long and longitude into a single variable. So it's uh, basically uh, think of it as an interleaving of latitude and longitude in uh, in uh, in bit format. So interleaving these two numbers and creating a single variable, and then indexing that, and that is a, that is called basically Z index or Z order or Morton order. So this is uh, one uh, often used strategy for spatial partitioning of a data set. And we are saying here two bits, so basically it divides the world in like four parts. But uh, you could go granular or, or uh, you know as much as you want depending on your use case and how you want uh, how you want to uh, index your data so when this is done it's basically at the end it's reporting I saved 1.2 million features on disk uh, on HDFS so that is how uh, one would ingest data 
Now we are going to just some demo and then basically showing how to use that data. So the support that we have, you can write a, both a, a Python application or a Spark application. So here is, for example, is an example of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you can write it in uh, Scala or Python. I'm not sure what I just said, but Scala or Python, and this is the Scala one. So we are basically reading the data from that, uh, from that location on HDFS. So that is what we wrote to in the previous uh, slide. We are writing it, uh, we are uh, reading it from there, reading it into a data frame. And then we are calling that data frame uh, a temporary table so that we can basically uh, then write a, a SQL query to, uh, to, to basically work with that data set. So this is just a count of that, which is 1.2 million. So this is how you would use Scala to, to work with that. Python is a bit more work here to actually uh, make it understand that uh, how to work with uh, GeoMesa. For Scala part, it was already integrated in the interpreter section, so we didn't need to do that. But here we do uh, for Python. So it's a bit of creating a Spark session that has already uh, understanding of GeoMesa and it can and uh, that it can work with it. This is the part to basically read the data again so the previous steps now is just in the um, in the python part so reading the data from from disk the same location in hdfs and uh, and again creating that table so that we can uh, write a sql query and uh, do our analysis and basically keep on working with that uh, table afterwards uh, only in SQL. So this is writing basically a SQL statement within uh, within PySpark interpreter. And this is how you would do it. So this is basically an operation of a bounding box, which is this area is it's covering roughly North America. So we are saying, give me the points that are falling within North America and do a count of it. So it does this uh, geospatial operation on vectors uh, with this uh, syntax, but my preference is to switch to SQL because we declared that table on top. Um, so this table is now available throughout this Zeppelin node and you can uh, use basically the SQL interpreter, which is the Py uh, Spark SQL uh, behind. So this variable was already declared on top and Spark already knows about it. So you can basically call it and, and keep working on it. So here just showing the, the few, uh, few records on, on tops and these are the different features within that. So there is this, uh, I think there is at the end that is the geometry uh, type column that has these uh, vectors. So here is just a point. So that is how we how we can work with it. Another operation in SQL again. This is counting the data by by dates and uh, basically showing. And these are we, we, we grab the first few days of 2017. So most of the data are are from those uh, dates. And this is the same operation basically I did before in PySpark. Uh, and this is now using Spark SQL directly, and so you can you basically uh, you can write a essentially a standard SQL statement here to work with that data set. So this is this is the same operation. Uh, it's a bounding box that roughly defines North America, and then uh, you can work with this data set uh, with this syntax. So I would say if you have a you know vector operations, this is uh, I've done you know quite a few different operations, especially in Hive and several years ago. But this is this is the most performant that I've seen, and also easy to use. And especially on the geo, on the let's let's say uh, you want to do exploration of data, but also you can have a you know very complicated stuff going on in a single Zeppelin node. So it could actually, uh, depending on your use case, it could very well work as a you know production code or or 
something out regard depends on your use case but uh, this setup actually is perfectly reasonable for working with large scale uh, vector data So do we have uh, questions uh, at this point? Uh, anybody would like me to explain something further? Um, Let's uh, get your microphone. Yeah, more to order. Is it, I, I just didn't understand, so it will um, convert latitude and longitude into one variable, like the relative kind of velocity and shallow So it's a, the implementation, the rough implementation, if I just give you some overall sketches, that, uh, think of it as, you know, latitude and longitude expressed in uh, binary form, and then it's, they are being interleaved into, so you can, you basically, let's say you, you, you take the, the first digit from this one and then first digit from this one, the second and second three, and so you just basically merge them together. So let's say if you have eight bits here, eight bits, you end up with a 16 bits interleaved. And then you, that's a variable, that's the new variable. And that is uh, a way to, uh, basically you want to do merge two variables together to create an index on top of it or partition it that's uh, a known method to do any other questions or are we good that's good yeah, so let's uh, go to section three then geopy spark so geopy spark i'll show you an example that actually is available on GeoPySpark's own Git, uh, GitHub uh, page. Uh, so this is largely adaptation of what they have put there. And I'll, I'm not going to actually execute this, but I'll explain to you how, how this is. So this is to, uh, it's a demo again, uh, and uh, getting uh, some data sets, a raster data set this time. So this is a national uh, land cover database uh, that is a raster that covers Pennsylvania, state of Pennsylvania. We are getting that data, we are downloading it, and then we are putting that data to, on HDFS. On our HDFS, so we are putting it uh, on temp. So it's going to go up there. So this is the part to create that uh, Spark application and a Spark cluster. So this is... Uh, so this is running basically on its own. It's not, uh, it's not through Zeppelin. It's basically its own. You can run this. We, we can run this, and we are running this on Master 1. So on Master 1, it connects, because there is already a Spark cluster that is set up. So there is a cross mass, Spark Master, Spark Workers that are already there. This one is basically connecting to that Spark cluster and creating a Spark application. So this is basically we are giving the you know the, the configuration for that Spark master that is already running, a Spark cluster that is already running, and GeoSpark. So this is kind of a bit boilerplate uh, you know code that uh, you can you can find out. I think this is uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we grabbed it from some of it at least from uh, from from their uh, GitHub repo as well. So this is the way to create a Spark context that is aware of GeoPySpark, and then you can use uh, uh, you know, GeoSpark functionalities within that. And this is, uh, I'll walk you through this part. This is an example of doing raster, uh, doing operations on raster. So this is uh, how you would uh, uh, process rasters with it. So we are reading that uh, raster uh, TIFF file. So it's, a, it's covering the state of Pennsylvania. We are reading it from that place on HDFS, which uh, we just uh, put it there in the you know, upper cell uh, just before. So it's a raster layer that uh, we are reading. Uh, and then an example of operations that are here, you are tiling the raster, 
reprojecting it to Web Mercator uh, spatial reference. And then we're creating a, just a polygon uh, so that we can do some operation on this raster. So it's a, it's a polygon that uh, uh, basically covers a small part of this estate, so a small part of the city, uh, city of Philadelphia. And the operation is basically masking that larger raster with this area of interest. So we are keeping that part. We are then pyramid this part uh, that we just masked. So it's creating basically different levels in this uh, creating pyramid so that uh, we can use this in a tile map server. So creating basically, you know, think of it as zoomed out versions of the same underlying original resolution data or raster data. So this is, this is how to create that those pyramid layers and then saving them on the same HDFS. So this is typically, you know, uh, these both uh, GeoPySpark and uh, and GeoMesa, they're typically not as rich as you know your traditional GIS software that you you know that they have matured over almost decades now. So these are not necessarily, you know, they would they wouldn't necessarily have everything that you would need as a geometrician in your work. They, they are bridging the gap and then, then you can, when you have big data and you, your existing solutions are, are not you know, up, to the, up to the job, then this, uh, these APIs, and these technologies are catching up so you can, you can use them. So this is one example of letting you know how to use uh, GeoPySpark uh, in, or, in order to process rasters. And this is just a listing of the files that once that above operation was done. So this is a very quick intro of uh, to GeoPySpark and uh, how that works. Now I'm on to section four and uh, large scale map matching with Spark and OSRM. So what we are using here is we are using a a data set called uh, Montreal, Montreal Trajet. So this was a program by City of Montreal that collected some data uh, through an app that people installed uh, that uh, they collected, uh, you know, they, they recorded their uh, transports, uh, transport uh, operations or when basically they took, uh, you know, took a bus or they got out or, you know, do, did whatever they do on a daily basis. They basically marked the trips that they made. And uh, this was uh, to study the, you know, the habits of uh, going through uh, habits of Montrealers, basically how they use the transport system, how they use the network, uh, the, you know, the, the street network, and uh, potentially to improve the, the mobility and transport options and the planning of, of the of city. So the data set that they have made available is coming from, you know, there's a point points data set, there's a uh, trips or trajet data set. So points data set is basically the raw data that this application collected. And then trajet is basically, uh, they have actually used the same OSRM engine to do the map matching. So they, they collected first the, the points and then they used the same uh, engine to do the map matching. So basically creating trips out of these points. So, from each uh, sequence of points, they have created the, the trip that, uh, you know, sequence of street, street segments that would have, uh, would be the, the path that the, the, the person actually took. So both of these data sets are available and uh, we are using it as a, as a demo here. Just to give you an idea here about the math behind map matching and what it, uh, what it involves and uh, how it's done. We are using OSRM uh, open source routing machine, which uh, has an implementation of this algorithm. Uh, there is another solution called Barefoot, uh, which is the last line here, which uh, also implements the same algorithm. So I'll, I'll share those, these slides so you can actually take your time and uh, read you through, read those, and get those links. And the algorithm is uh, by uh, Newson and, uh, and, the, and uh, colleagues. So this is an algorithm based on hidden Markov model. So this is basically serves to find the most uh, probable state sequence for a given sequence of observations. So 
think of it as states that are uh, street segments, road segments, and then the observations are the, uh, the GPS, the noisy GPS readings that we have. And uh, at the same time, we have this road network that is available as a data set. So we know that you know going from street A to street B, there's a probability that could happen. Uh, for example, if the street is here and the other street is, uh, I don't know, let's say on east, uh, I, in the east of Montreal, the other street is on the west of Montreal, so the probability of uh, going directly from this one to that one is zero. So we are feeding the, the model with this transition probabilities going from this street to that street. So that is the transition probabilities. And then uh, the measurement probabilities are, are also related to observation probabilities are uh, also uh, you know, coming from the GPS data. So after having this probabilities observation and transitions through the HMM model, we use the VTRB algorithm to find the most probable path th through this lattice. So it would give you the sequence of street segments that would be best describe the actual path through the street that was taken by the person. And uh, the same concept can be applied to, you, to other networks. You know, if you have bike paths, you have railroads, and you are collecting data set, uh, you know, devices that capture data on trains or on bikes, and then you have the network also. Uh, you can use the same technology and same algorithm basically to do the map matching. So just a brief note on how how this is uh, working. Just a screenshot here to show you know some randomly selected trips, and I'll actually show you the, uh, the Jupyter notebook behind this. But uh, on the left, you are showing the the points as well as the the trips uh, uh, themselves. But on the right, uh, I've just removed the points so that we can you we can see the the trips underneath. So the blue ones are the are the are the trips. So you would see that uh, for you know how the map matching was done. So that's uh, just a screenshot, but I'll I'll explain to you when I get to um, the Jupyter notebook that has it. So I'll explain to you the perform map matching through a Zeppelin node, and then uh, showing the same map that I just showed you. Uh, in a Jupyter notebook, and then just show, sharing with you some performance test results at the end. So reading the file, so basically this is reading the points file from our HDFS. And then, so it's, it puts it in a Spark data frame. Again, we are creating a table, temporary table, so we can write a SQL statement against it. And this is roughly about uh, 13 million points. So this is going to take a few minutes, uh, a few seconds, about 20 seconds. It's going to come back. And the number of trips is about uh, just, or, just under 200k trips. So 200k trips corresponding to 30 million points. So this is uh, now writing it just, uh, you know, doing some analytics on this data set that we just read. So from points data, from points uh, table, we are just sorting this uh, based on trip ID. And uh, we want to see basically, you know, what are the what are the points that uh, what are the trips that have the most uh, uh, most point uh, count of points. So, for example, this one is the this trip ID has the most points in it. Reading the trips file is is about the same. So this is. reading the trips file and then uh, reading the trips file here so we have about uh, 200k trips that we have in this data set in the second data set we are calling that uh, you know, that data frame, Spark data frame uh, trips, so that again, we are uh, doing some analytics here. 
this is uh, sorting the data, uh, basically grouping it by mode of transport. So there is a specific field that was only available in this trips data set, which is the mode of transport that was indicated by the user themselves. So it's a user reported uh, transport mode. So you would take, you know, you would do maybe take a bus or take a car and then you would indicate I took my car, you label it yourself. So obviously users could, you know, could make mistakes. They could, uh, there are some mistakes that could be, uh, you know, in the data set. Also there could be some uh, imperfection. Let's say you walked through a park and then you took your car and then you drove downtown and then you just mark the whole thing as a car trip. So the map matching is going to probably fail for some, at least some parts of this trip that you took because it's not all. But uh, we are doing a first level filtering here, so we're just keeping everything that people said were car trips. So this is about uh, 24,000 uh, car trips that are in this data set. Here we are um, selecting just 16 random trips out of this data set. And uh, I'm going to find out with you what the map matching is going to look like on this one. So we are basically saying, okay, keep us, uh, keep only the, the car trips here. Uh, we are picking all the trip IDs that are car trips, and then we are selecting just random, random uh, 16 of this. So these are the random selection of the, out of the status set. And then we are going to the points, to points uh, table, and we are saying, okay, now give me all the points that had this trip ID. So we are basically getting all the points that are coming from um, from these. This is an analytics uh, which is not required here right now. This is now creating, basically sorting the data by trip ID and then time. And uh, I think it's uh, visible enough, uh, but it's a bit, uh, when it's running, it's a bit uh, grayed out. So for each trip that we were basically saying, we are creating a Spark data frame, which basically has, uh, has these columns. So there's, there's a trip ID, and then there's a, we, we're calculating what's the start, uh, start time for this trip, what's the end time for this one. And uh, we are saying create a, uh, a column that uh, that basically it's a list of all the points that for this that were in this trip. So this is basically a collect list uh, SQL operation here. So uh, we want to just have everything in one record. So that's how we we can do it. And once that is done, and this is the map matching part. So for these 16, the way we do it, and if, you're, if you were in my presentation about machine learning and using scikit-learn and how to distribute that over the cluster, this is basically the same logic. So it's a using a user-defined data frame that we are creating here. And we are, uh, in that user-defined uh, function, uh, user-defined function UDF, we are calling this function which is, uh, which is defined right above. Now what this function does, I'll explain in a bit, but how we call this is that in our uh, Spark data frame that we just created just, uh, just uh, a bit earlier that had those uh, you know, ID columns, uh, basically they are in, in here as well. We are saying call this, uh, call this function, call this UDF, on, this, on the, all the points that were there, so that list of points that are there, and then create a new column for me that has the result of this map matching process. So this new column is basically here. This is the string that OSRM returns to you when you send a request for map matching. It sends back to you a string and that is we are basically saving it in this new column. So basically for each record we have the trip ID, start time, end time, and then that uh, list of ordered list of points and a new column which is the response from from OSRM and what this function does is that it's basically a bit reprocesses that string that we are sending to OSRM because OSRM expects it to be a specific format this list of points that you're sending to it 
it, you know, in terms of commas and semicolons. So we are just formatting correctly. And essentially, it's a URL that we are calling in each worker locally. And we are passing this list of points to that URL. So we are using the, uh, this URL that you know, this API of OSRM to call it. You know, we are sending the, the list of points. And it sends back the data. And we are saving it for each record here. So that is how it's done. And here we're just creating a GeoJSON file to uh, store what we got. So the points and, 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 and the, uh, the trips and the points, we are just uh, collecting everything. We are putting it uh, in a single GeoJSON file. And, and I'm going to plot it um, right in the Jupyter Notebook. So it saves it locally on this, in this place. And this bottom of the, is the, you know, the first few parts of this GeoJSON file. And I like to do this in Jupyter. So this Jupyter notebook basically is going to pick up this file that we just dropped on there in the in Zeppelin. So this is the result of map matching that we just did. So these are randomly selected and so these are the trips that, that resulted from our map matching process. So you can examine. Uh, some of them may not be perfect, but this one actually looks, uh, looks good. So this is uh, just a visualization of, um, of the result of map matching that we just did. We have another notebook which is very similar to what I showed you. And the only difference is, uh, is at the bottom. So we are reading. This is the performance test of map matching. We wanted, we wanted to basically test how fast we can go, uh, what is the performance of this, uh, you know, doing it uh, in a uh, doing it in a distributed fashion, basically. So the first parts are the same. Uh, here only that we are now not selecting just 16 randomly selected, we are selecting all card, card, uh, card trips. So it selects basically all, all 24,000 trips here. And uh, the rest is almost the same again creating, and I'm not going to run this because it's going to take a bit uh, longer, ordering, creating at the spark data frame. So the only difference is, is the last part. And Actually, the only difference is uh, putting some statements to measure time so that we can know uh, how much, how much uh, this took. So we know that we are using 12 cores here. So we are just creating a um, creating variable saying, OK, we, are, we have 12 cores for this Spark cluster. These functions are the same. Uh, we are writing it on, H on HDFS. We are saying, you know, put them all, repartition all, everything into a single CSV file in HDFS. And when this operation is done, it's basically saying I process 24,000 trips on this 12 core Spark cluster in about 10 minutes, and which corresponds to about just over 200 trips uh, per minute per CPU core. So that is our kind of performance number of this architecture, of this uh, perfectly parallel processing architecture. I think uh, I covered everything here. Yes, Zeppelin node and that. I think that is fine. Uh, any questions? Uh, there's a mic coming. So this is, this is a URL that we are calling in each worker. So 
Spark itself, the task Spark tasks in that Spark application, in each task, it manages that behind the scenes. So in this Spark data frame, in each record of this Spark data frame, it calls this function per record and it automatically distributes this over the cluster. So it waits for the result of one map matching to come before calling another and it, it's running it uh, roughly about 12 tasks at the same time so that it's not overloading, it's, uh, it's basically waiting to get the results back before sending a, basically calling the comp function on the same, uh, on the next record uh, on, in this data frame. So here, it's a URL that, that is called locally in each worker, and the Spark does that. And here we are passing the points, so we are building that URL here. It's a URL that contains the list of points. And when it, so OSRM receives all, everything that it needs to do the map matching. So here, for example, uh, it's the core profile of OS, OSRM. And then it gets the list of points and there are a few parameters that we typically use when we're working with OSRM. Uh, and when the results coming back, it's basically saying, you know, here's the list of points map matched and and also all the metadata that uh, OpenStreetMap has, for example, street names and everything else that, uh, that returns. So, is that good? I'm wondering about the like, scaling of this. Like, I'm imagining for smaller data sets, this isn't necessarily going to be more performant than something like PostGIS, but at what stage would this um, with this scale, so like you're talking about like excess of like 10,000, 100,000 million rows. Um, at what stage would this become a problem with the solutions? That's a very good question, and I don't have a good answer actually for that. Uh, it's it's very empirical. You know, you got to do tests to see where is it that you're hitting that performance. But I would say, in a long-term project, if you are in a program, you know, let's say a large program that is continuously collecting data and you see that at some point this is going to break and, you know, the processing times are going to be unacceptable uh, at some point, you would, I would say it's better to build your stack on these technologies so that at the end you can scale because if you don't, you would go fast at the beginning but then you will hit a wall and then you will have to come back and re-engineer everything. So it's very risky to go, if it's like more your data projection, data collection projection, that would determine that. This one question. Maybe the last one, and then uh, I'll be available throughout the evening for the for rest of it. First of all, uh, good work. I have an answer for you, because we did exactly the same thing. At the start of the project with post GIS and map matching, we went for uh, almost a week of processing. At the, at the end of the project, we dropped to one hour of processing for map matching the whole trips data sets. So with PostGIS, we managed one hour and Spark eight, nine minutes, ten minutes. So it's quite faster. And uh, I have a question. Uh, do you plan to guess um, the transport modes of the trips that are nodes uh, with the, the speed, the, the, the speed temp on the GPS. We have, you have the speed, so can yep. you plan to do uh, to do something like that? Um, no, not on this project. I've done actually some similar. And actually, I happened to work on a transport mode detection project with the, a deep learning model a couple of years ago. So I've worked on this, but uh, for this one it wasn't necessary, it was just uh, doing, doing, you know, performance tests to see how fast we can do the map matching part, given that uh, the labels are correct. But if we have significant doubt, we, we, we need to maybe do a pre-processing step to actually maybe not trust the, the, the labels given, but actually we determine that from the, from the data. So. Because I think 60% of the data is no. Yeah, exactly. It's it's not even labeled. Yeah, but the goal here was just to the on the map matching part. 
Uh, and I think uh, if there's a project, for sure, uh, that, that could be done. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone.